It smells glorious. Mm. <laughs> this smells so good. It's very heady. It's like florally and heady. It's right next to the door. It's right next to the door. And this is the type of stuff, like the cherry trees and things like this. This is the type of stuff that I see being planted over there. Mm -hmm. Actually, in the distance, you'll see the, the shock of purple. That's a Cirsus canadensis. Mm -hmm. And that is an eastern red bud, so I could see like those colors coming through up on the on the driveway. And hey, what are we doing today? <laughs> Where are you going? Uh, I'm uh, You're wrong, going to work. Wrong, uh, wrong department. We're gonna go All I knew is that the dress code was earth, earth tone today. Earth tones. <laughs> no, oh shit! I don't think um, I got that. I'm just bringing my laptop in case I have a chance to get some stuff done. Joey's a workaholic. What's this little building? This little oh like yeah, so, so there's part of a cemetery. They had a, like a little service in there for people yeah. before they buried them. Yeah. And now it's not really used for anything. It's so but it's really nice inside. I got a chance to go in there a couple years ago. Yeah. We have to take note of this deer fence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was a big. It's a big deal. And uh, this is what our by. forest could look like, essentially. That's right. Yeah. So let's go back 20,000 years. Yeah. When this was probably under at least 2,000 feet of ice. Right. And then the glaciers retreated. And then uh, various plants came in sort of in, in sequence. Like they didn't come out all at once. Like it didn't reforest all one time with yeah. all the species. Like one species would come in and another. And of course, indigenous people came in too and colonized this region. But uh, we don't have a lot of evidence that native peoples are right here in this spot. Uh, they think they probably walked down to the lake to fish, but there weren't any villages right here. We haven't found artifacts right. like that. So let's jump to the Revolutionary War. Uh, when that was fought and the United States won, they didn't really have money to pay the soldiers because yeah. there was no, you know, no government, no money, no yeah. currency. Yeah. So they took land. Of course, they took it from the India the yeah. people and they gave it to people who fought in the war. Yeah. And so they gave, in New York, people got 600 acres. So this was part of a 600 acre tract, started right at that corner, mm -hmm. kind of went out that way and this way. And it was given to a fellow named Atkinson mm -hmm. who just turned around and kind of sold it because a lot of them didn't want to farm it, they just wanted the money. Yeah. So he sold it, that was his money for fighting. And then that land got passed through a few owners. We don't exactly know who they were because you know, deeds and all, it weren't really yeah. kept track of very well back then. Yeah. But then uh, a family called Halsey got it. Like he, Halsey Road. Like Halsey Road, yeah. Halseyville is down yeah. here. He was a state senator, and so he was like a f famous person. He bought it. And they cleared a lot of the land. They put up some mills along the creek. They farmed it, but for some reason, we don't know why, this section here didn't get cut down hmm. or farmed. And the soil here is pretty good for agriculture. It's one yeah. of the reasons why the trees are so large. Yeah. So uh, he kept it for a while in his family. And eventually he wanted to borrow some money. So he gave it to the bank. The bank had it for a while. And then they sold it to this wallpaper salesman in New York City <laughs> to use as a place to come and camp. So, so far everything was cut for farming, but this stayed uh, probably because it was beautiful and you didn't want to cut it. The wallpaper salesman, at that time, you know, wallpaper was like, the biggest, greatest thing. And they have people who sold wallpaper, like really rich and, and uh, anyway, he made a lot of money off of that. <laughs> and so he came up here and bought the land and used it for camping. Yeah. When he passed away, his sons inherited it. They weren't big campers. They lived in New York. They didn't want to come all the way up here. So uh, his name was Smith, Henry yeah. Smith. He's buried right across the Oh, okay, the so that's how Smith Woods. That's how Smith Woods got its name. Okay. His sons didn't want it. So they established like a little trust. Yeah. And so we're going to give it to the trust for like a dollar and you guys can manage it. And that was the 1909 wow. thing. And so then for like the next hundred years or so, this trust had it. Mm -hmm. and they didn't really have a vision for how it could be used or wasn't used for education or anything. It was just here. Mm -hmm. And so then uh, they decided they didn't want any more because in 1989, there was a big windstorm that blew through here and knocked down a bunch of trees. And the people on the board thought, oh, we should harvest those trees and sell it because it's some money and mm -hmm. we can use that to pay our board insurance. And a lot of other people said, 
No, windstorms are part of nature. You know, yeah. just let the trees rot. And yeah. there's food for organisms and bugs and insects and all that. Right. So there was this big controversy. Letters to the editor for a little town of Chumansburg. Everybody was all fired up over what to do with Smith Woods. And people came down on both sides of it. So they ended up pulling the trees that fell out of here. And uh, they did log it. Yeah. Got some money, but they got so much grief for that and from some other things. They just decided they didn't want any more. So okay. they offered it to the Kiga Nature Center who took it over. Right. And from that point, you know, we put in trails and we started running educational programs. But the big problem we had in here was that there was no regeneration. Like when you look through here, yeah. you can see it's pretty clear. Yeah. And in a real true old growth forest, you got lots of regeneration. We don't yeah. have that here because of the deer population is about 10 times higher here than what's considered Substance, natural sustainable, or sustainable and optimal yeah right and so then the, so when did the deer fence go in no, 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 two years ago oh only two years only two ago. years ago so that was oh. that was also controversial because okay. people thought well it's supposed to be kept in its natural state yeah. and you shouldn't be fencing things out and it's going to look ugly yeah. and all that but we did a lot of research and we found a fence that's practically invisible yeah and put that in there and it's made a huge difference um and we'll see like we're starting to see these beech trees regenerate, yeah, yeah. we're seeing maple ceilings come up, uh, with the trillium, the wildflowers are, were amazing this year. Yeah. So it's made a huge difference in just a couple of years. So well, we think it's gonna recover now. That's really good news because you didn't do any kind of enrichment planting or anything, it popped up over the two years. So this gives us a really good indication actually as to what our forest might be able to do if we assemble that deer fence because ours is completely, yeah. it looks like this, it's bare ground. Yeah. I mean, we have some trout lilies and we have some may apples, um, but that's about it, you know, that we see on the ground. Yeah. And, and, and very few seedlings, there may be some white pine seedlings and that's about it. Yeah. Yeah. So we were um, about, when I first moved here, like 20 years ago, 25 years ago, Trumansburg, there were a lot of trillium in here, but you could just gradually see it diminishing. Yeah. yeah. And then we put up the fence, and then like the next spring or so, boom. That's amazing. They came, and you know, trillium it takes. Is, is that some that I see over there? Uh, we'll or? see. We'll see some nice okay. populations up here as we go. It takes trillium, you know, seven years to grow from a seed to a, a flowering plant. So if they seven years, yeah. I have no idea because you could either buy well, it as a bulb or some seed, right? So yeah, but the problem is it's mostly in the shade most of the year. Here's so it only right has. There. A f this is a red one. Yeah. There's two species here. There's the red and then the white. And we'll get some really good pictures yeah. here in a little bit. But it only has light for, what, four or five weeks? Yeah. And so it has to do everything in that time. So um, in a forest like this, most of the, or, you know, the spring ephemerals only grow for a few weeks. And that's kind of it. They're I'm so glad lot. we're kind of getting them right at the right time. You see the big white floppy? Yeah. Is that Granda flora? Gran yes. Have you had to clear out any of the invasive? Yeah, so that's the only sort of active management we do here yeah. is clear out invasive. So we've done, when we first acquired the woods, we took out, you know, barbarian, honeysuckle. There wasn't a lot because it's in the shade and most invasives like light. Yeah. So it wasn't a lot, but we had some. The, edges, then. the big invasive is this uh, ground cover right here. The vinca. The vinca. Yeah. It's like all over the place. Vinca minor, the, isn't it minor? Yes, yeah. yes. The stuff. It's pretty, but, it, uh, it's really invasive in the old growth forest because it's evergreen. So yeah. when the leaves fall off the tree, it's got four or five months of light. Right. And it can keep growing. So we're thinking about doing some research here uh, with Cornell to figure out how can we eliminate it. But if you see down through there, there's so much, it's not like we can ever pull it out by well, hand. we've noticed in our woods, and I don't know if this is something that you could comment on, but um, we've had daffodils naturalize in mm -hmm. our forest. Right. So that's like, but they don't seem to spread like a finger right. or something like that. So it seems like it's not something that it, it, is it's, too concerning. It's not considered invasive. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, they naturalize, but not everything that naturalizes becomes invasive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, so what are the oldest trees yeah. that we're seeing so here? So in, uh, let's start with this hemlock. Okay. So in, I mentioned a windstorm <laughs> in 1989, so yeah. when it fell down, a bunch of trees fell down. Yeah. The logging company came in and uh, took the trees out, but they cut the the trees at the base, and we counted rings. And yeah. we found a hemlock that we aged to 1662. Holy crap. Yeah. So the hemlocks... Like 400 years, basically. Almost, yeah. yeah. So hemlocks uh, grow really slowly. When those yeah. trees fell, we measured the circumference of all these trees and counted the rings. 
So then we could get a, a relationship between the size of the tree and how old it mm -hmm. was. Estimate. But so we for that species. For that species. Yeah. We did it for different species. Yeah. And for this species, we estimate based on its circumference that it was born in 1740. Wow. So 271 years. That is That's what we impressive. Think. Before the Sullivan campaign, before all of that, before right? Before all that, yeah. yeah. Wow. So it's seen yes. a lot. It's seen a lot. Yeah, and so these are probably some of the older, the hemlocks are probably some of the older trees, but that oak that we saw is also pushing, you know, this age as well. And they look so healthy, actually. So there are... Like, has there been any effect from the woolly uh, delgid? Yeah, yeah, we'll see evidence of that when we walk around. Okay. Uh, so this, look how straight they are. This, yeah, so <laughs> this is a white pine here. Yeah. It's absolutely fantastic, amazing white pine. Wow. You don't see that anymore. No. And it, so New York used to have a lot of white pine trees. Yeah. They were cut for timber, which is was fine. That yeah. it has rot resistant wood and it's nice and light. And so when they cut down all the trees and cleared this land, the Civilian Conservation Corps in the 1930s came back in and planted white pine. Yeah. But there was a beetle that chewed the apical meristem of the white pine trees and stunned them all. So if you go to like the National Forest up here, you'll find yeah. acres and acres of white pine that were planted by a civilian conservation corps. They're all stubby little things. Ugh. They didn't get this tall. So yeah. invasive species are terrible. And, you know, they affected the white pine, the woolly adelgid, yeah. and hemlock, the beech bark disease, which we'll see, it's the damaging the beech. Yeah. Um, emerald ash borer is right on our doorstep. Yeah. And so our forests are really Is there in ash in this, in this forest too? We've not found emerald ash borer yet. Okay, you know, we noticed it partially in the open areas of our land. But in the forest where you have an ash tree and there's all the different species around it, it's not affected okay, yet. So, so it maybe it. it's hopefully like if you have like a clump of ash, you might be in a, yeah. in a problem area. But then if you have ash in with like everything else, I think maybe they don't get to it. Yeah. Or at least it's gonna take a little while for them to find it. Yeah. Which goes to show you that like biodiversity is where you wanna yeah, go. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. We got some nice black cherry too, really tall. Something I almost right don't even recognize it because it, mature bark is so different, So different, right? yeah. yeah. And then same way right here is another black cherry. Oh, that one right there? Yeah. Wow. It looks so different because you never see mature wood. That big, right? Yep. Oh yeah, and look at, you could see now because mm -hmm. it, it almost like breaks out of Yes, it. exactly. There's <laughs> little lenses. It's like right the across. Hulk, you know, it's like. Pfft. Yep. Wow, that's cool. It's so neat to see because, you know, we really wanted to come here because we found this 200 plus year old white oak on our on our land. Is this like Smith Woods material? <laughs> I don't know. We haven't. Well, it's there old yet. as. I'm sure it's old as uh, trees like that. It also has like things growing on it. Yeah. You know. Oh, it's 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 an ecosystem into it, so. It's just so spectacular seeing something that large compared to everything else, which is like so tiny. Yeah. And you're like, this is what a forest could really look like. Yeah. You know, if you just let it regrow. They often uh, leave, left those trees for property boundaries. Yeah. So oftentimes around here, you'd be going through a lot of smaller trees. And I want you to find this gigantic maple or oak, which marked a corner of the property for uh, somebody. It's so beautiful. But, it's it's close to the road. So we were like, well, maybe that oh, is maybe a, it was a property. Yeah. Boundary, yeah. But if I look off into the distance here, I can see all the trillium like yes, growing let's up. Walk up there. so beautiful. Let's walk up there. Yep. And we can see like oh, maple Solomon ceilings seal? coming up, which maple, we didn't. Maple, Solomon seal, geranium. Yep. yep. Yeah. What's this? You know? Oh, uh, yeah, that's Actea. Um, they call it doll's eyes. Oh, it I haven't seen It produces a, a white berry with a little um, red or black dot on it. Oh, okay. And the pioneer girls, particularly, you made little doll babies and yeah. use those for the eyes. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. Oh, this is this brings me so much hope. Now we don't have vinca minor in our, our yeah. forest. We just have like, you know, leaves. <laughs> right. But if the trillium, if this took two, two years for this to regrow, I feel like really hopeful. There's hope. Yeah, it's just, uh, just a nice little patch. Yeah. And some beautiful red specimens. Oh my gosh, they get so large too.
And then is this a, a another oak? What is this one? Let me see what this one is. I think this is a tulip poplar. Oh, that's a tulip yeah. poplar. Yeah, and oh my god. Yeah, that's tulip <laughs> you can't poplar. Can't see the leaves. It's yeah. So if you look right here, there's a tulip poplar. Yeah. And there's a bunch of them right here. Yeah. They're all about the same size, and they're about 130 years old, and we we know that because we for the tree ring thing. Right. And so the question then is, there's this ring of tulip pop, they're all about the same size, all about 130 years old. The question is, why is that here, like yeah. that? And the answer is, if you look at the dominant forest species in old growth forest, it's beech, maple, and hemlock. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the understory, we see beech, maple, and hemlock. Mm -hmm. And that's because those are the shade tolerant trees and they eventually dominate because it's shady and they're the ones that survive right. to maturity. Yellow poplar only grows where there's light. It has to germinate in the light. So around in here, 130 years ago, there was some event that opened up the forest and let light in. Mm -hmm. So all the yellow poplar germinated at the same time. And then they got shaded and no more germinated. But there, So there was a fire or a big uh, windstorm or something right in this area yeah. 130 years ago. Yeah. And all wow. the yellow poplar drew, drew in. It's so cool to be so, able to just um, create these stories from just, you know, looking at the trees. Not the only trees. just like analyzing the tree rings, but the composition and how old they are. And I mean, this and what was this that had fallen down here? And what's that the was a beach. And what, what's the importance of actually leaving it? Because you said that there was this big yeah, controversy. Oh, there's a with huge. Like, um, so back up a little. Old growth forest, which, by the way, there's only three tenths of 1% of forests are old growth. Can I pull this out? You sure can. <laughs> <laughs> I've been pulling so, this out of my woods. So most of the forest. This is a uh, garlic mustard, right? And it's like, uh, it's invasive. Uh, I recognize the flower. Yeah. Uh, it actually tastes good. It was brought over here. Yeah, people use it It's a culinary eat. herb, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Kind of escaped. So old growth forest, so they were pretty rare. I mean, the beauty of this is it's so close to the road and it's so flat. Like most old growth forests, you have to like hike a long distance or walk through the water to get, because right. you can't get the logging equipment. They're really yeah. the cliff face. The cliff face, yeah. But here it's right along. So it's really amazing. It's still preserved. And so there's only three tenths of 1%, but they are the most diverse ecosystems that we have. And, and what really so, constitutes an old growth? Like when does it become an old growth forest? Yeah, so around here, if you take like land like you have with yeah. nothing on it, like an old field, it's 350 years before it looks like this. Guys, we're gonna be dead before years. that time. <laughs> so you gotta take one of those, you gotta go into suspended animation yeah. for a couple of centuries yeah. and come back out and wake up. We'll never so, see it as an old growth woods. <laughs> we only have like that 200 plus year old and we'd have to live another 100 years to even, to even see that. <laughs> That's yeah. why we're just stewards. We're just kicking the ball. We're yeah. kicking the ball. Yeah, so, it's, so what makes it old growth uh, and the evidence of that is we don't see branches down low on the trees. Right. So they obviously had to grow up really high uh, before they saw light and started to branch. The other thing is if you look at the, the surface, it's undulating because like this mound right here mm -hmm. is where a tree fell over and tipped up the soil right. and it leaves it. And as we walk through here, we'll see all kinds of tip up mounds. And that's an, a, another indication it was never plowed or, or logged or anything like that. And, that. and that's also important for uh, wildlife and everything too, right? The, those, just letting the forest kind of create those undulations and... Yeah, yeah, stirring up the soil brings up nutrients and things like that. Yeah. And these trees that fall like this, I mean, this is a whole ecosystem in itself. You know, yeah. you got beetles, and if there was a entomologist, you might, uh, Quentin Wheeler, I think was his name. Yeah. Because you were in entomology. He discovered yeah. a species of beetle here in this woods that really? was never found before. Really? Yeah. Yeah, it's in the book. You can look it up. It's probably not endemic, but is it, or they don't really um, know. Endemic to, might be endemic to the Northeast. Yeah. I'm not sure. But then you've got this whole, you know, decomposing community of uh, fungi. Yeah. That live on this too. And. Have you ever seen any cool fungi here? There's a lot of cool fungi here. Yeah. 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 yeah we have the mycologists come out and walk around and take pictures and things like that. Yeah. That's cool. Because, um, yeah, there's a lot of decomposing. So we, we want to keep this. Even, you know, it fell, it's a beach, it's a come to beach water disease, it fell, but you know, it also provides food nutrients for the next 
generation of things that yeah, come along. Yeah, you can see there is a skeletonizer. Oh, yeah. Skeletonizing the, the <laughs> leaf. It's like a bug? Yeah. yeah. Now, this looks like it was, had been a found, what is that, a foundation? So here, and right at the entrance, in 1950, uh, the village thought they could maybe turn this into a picnic ground. I see. So they made a couple of fireplaces. Okay. Oh, wait, here, there's a jack in the pulpit. Jack in the pulpit. Mm -hmm. And houseplant enthusiasts will know that this is an aeroid family <laughs> with that spadix and spade. Okay, so this is where they would do like a little fire or something like yes. that. Yes, yeah. I, I think there were only like two or three of these, so they yeah. never really developed it. Yeah. But they gave it a name, it's called the Piney Woods Campground. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> it never really took off, but they did have a few remnant fire. Well, places. I just think that this is pretty amazing from the fact that like this is, it, it kind of seemed like tossing the potato, like the hot potato, like it, <laughs> it did just never got developed in any kind of way. And yeah. just by through luck or folly or. Yeah. And now it's, it's uh, embedded in the deed that, you know, it can't be developed. Yeah. So it should be forever. Yeah. Wild as close as we can get. I yeah. mean, it's human impacted, obviously, from, yeah. even from native peoples all the way up, but no one can like log it or build a house here anymore. Is this? This is blue cohosh. Oh, that's cool too. Another good native. Yes. And they get those blue, like really blueberries, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And then we also have, I think there's a tooth wart. I don't know if you're familiar with this one or not. Oh, no. So it's um, tooth wart. And the reason it's called tooth wart is because the teeth on the margins of the leaves. Yeah. And the interesting, the genus is Dentaria, same root as dentures or dentine oh, gum, yeah, Dentaria, yeah. and toothwort. So, so does it taste, have a taste to I don't, it? Or? No, I okay. don't believe so, no. And was it used for anything like for your I, teeth? I think it's just because care? it has the, just the ridges, teeth you know, back, edge, but yeah. a lot of people back in the day thought that if it looked like a tooth, it might have something to, to do, do with, with your, your tooth. It looks like a liver, it's good right. for your liver. We, we'll see hepatica yeah. all the way around, but it looks yeah. like a, a liver and so forth, yeah. I mean, this just gives me an indication of what's what's gonna come back, you know? Yep. I didn't realize that you only had the deer fence for the last two years. Yes. Night and day. I mean, we don't even have Solomon seal, and I see your Solomon seal coming back as well. So are some of the beach coming up from um, the beach bark disease? Uh, they're so, coming up for the roots. The, okay. So it'll probably end up being like chestnut. Yeah. Where um, it'll get only so big and then yeah. it'll die back down. Has there anybody been any kind of um, enrichment planting, like reintroducing like a the back crosses of chestnut or? They're, they have those trees. Yeah. Um, and there's uh, two approaches. One is, you know, back crossing a lot. Yeah. And then, but they can also genetically engineer resistance into the trees. And oh. I believe Syracuse has some of those. Okay. And uh, so, the, but they're just not gonna like go out yeah. and repopulate. Yeah. So. And then also, do you have hickory here? Yeah, we'll see hickory. Okay. It's usually in the dry, or in the wetter area. Yeah. We're sort of in the top, it's a little dry. Yeah. Then we'll drop down, it'll be a little bit wetter, and there'll be a lot of hickory. Uh, this is a nice light gap. See, so a tree fell down, opened up this gap. And you can just look how there's a lot of plants growing in here, and then they don't in the shade. Yeah. And different species. And so some of these will die out. Some of these are kind of shrubby. Some of the trees are short. I'll show you the tulip poplar right here, because now we yeah, actually- Yeah, because now we have light. Yes, yeah. so look at that. <laughs> we have light. We've got tulip poplar here. Look at these here. They're all germinating yeah. right in here because there's a light gap. And this is even, is this like a raspberry? That's a, blackberry? that's a blackberry, blackberry right there, but we do have a uh, raspberry yeah. right in here as well. Um, and we also have, um, we have a lot of sugar maple when we talked about that. I saw that, We yeah. also have, you know, box elder maple. Oh, yes. Which is coming in here in the light gap. And then you have some um, ostrich ferns or are these? Mm-hmm, yes. Yeah. And of course, garlic mustard again, which likes the light. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we'll try to kind of pull it out. They're, it's pretty easy to pull out. It's just so prolific. It's, yes, yes. There are four species of maple in here. There's sugar maple, red maple, box elder maple, 
And then there's a fourth species. Striped? Striped maple. Yeah. And there's a whole clump right here of striped maple. Wait, but I've never gap. seen like really big, uh, like I see it with well, the black. They don't, oh. they don't get big, yeah. but this is, you know. And, but I don't know how long this has been here. Yeah. Because it could have come in in a light gap. So right. it's probably not more than 40 or 50 years. Very distinctive bark. Very distinctive bark. Yeah. But the other thing that is, is distinctive about it, every single one of these, every single one of these is damaged here at the base. Huh. You can look at all this little, oh, little yeah. growth, every single one of them. What do you think happened? Oh, uh, I know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, from buck rubs. Oh, the deer I see. The deer to, love yeah. to rub their antlers on this tree. Yeah. And I think all undulates do it. So there must be something about that tree that they like. Yeah. Because the common name for this further north is moose wood. Hmm. And again, the, mo the reason because the moose yeah. like to rub the antlers. So I don't know, it might be some smell or yeah. I don't know if it's texture, why that would be different. Yeah. But now that we excluded the deer, we won't see that anymore. Yeah. But it's just so interesting that we see so much of that. Oh, wow. Here's another big yellow poplar. And again, a, a tulip tree. Yeah. And one of the things I, when I bring groups through here, I asked them how old that tree is, and I remind them that that hemlock was about the same size, and so they all guess, you know. Around the same 300 age. 300 age. Yeah. But then it's not because it's much younger. Yeah. Because it spent its whole life in the sun, so it grows really quickly and fast. And you said also the soil quality here is pretty good, right. so it probably grows faster. Right. It, it right. Remind me, reminds me of cottonwoods, like cottonwoods yeah. seem so young, but they grow they so grow big. They grow so fast, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And here's some violets, right? Uh-huh, yes. Oh, they're so cute. Look. And there's a nice clump of red, some really big yeah, red. Yeah, the right red there. trilliums. The trilliums are just like, that's one of the things that I was looking to like enrichment plant, but you're, you're giving me a lot of hope that just by excluding the deer, they'll come back on their own. I would imagine they might, yeah. yeah. Oh, and look at these uh, little collections of violets right here. They're more dense mm -hmm. right here. Well, look at the American beech, because, you know, again, we have such tiny American beech, and they've all been affected by the beech bark disease, mm -hmm. but, you know, this iconic, like, nice gray bark, mm -hmm. and it maintains that. Some of them get really, you know, they look like they have, like, cross-country tracks on it, but this one yeah. maintains its smoothness. Mm -hmm. It looks like it leaves out later than the others too. Yes. At least it's the bigger trees do. The younger yeah. trees come out sooner. Yeah. Like and I don't know if it's some sort of an adaptation to help the younger trees when there's light. They right. leaf out earlier so they get advantage of light yeah. before it gets shaded. Yeah. Whereas the bigger ones can take their time because yeah. they're gonna have the light all summer long. Exactly. It's like <laughs> kinda like the mama tree and it's like I'll put out I'll put out my leaves later, let my yeah, children. Like, yeah, grow. exactly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> It's so funny to like, like you said, that the old growth forest, you're so close to the road, you could hear it. Yeah. And you expect that you'd have to like really travel out of your way to go see it. So but the I, fact that it's so accessible. But I will say once the leaves come out, it does get really quiet in here. It's yeah. almost like a little peaceful sanctuary. Yeah. Maybe not so much right here, but like it's a little bit further down. So this just snapped off this spring, hmm. this hemlock. Um, from this tree right here. So again, the wind storm, um, it's not a necessarily a very protected site. So the wind does do damage. And so we'll snap these trees off. And do you do any kind of selective cutting now or culling anything? The only thing that's been cut yeah. in the last, um, well, since Cuga Nature Center has managed it, is this tree right here in front of us that we're gonna see. So we did cut a few Norway maples because they're not oh, native. Yeah. But uh, again, because it's shaded and old growth, we don't get a lot of invasives to cut. Yeah. But we did um, cut this tree down this spring because it was dead and it was really close to trail and it was dropping branches. I see. And we didn't want anybody getting, anybody hurt. getting hurt. So we, it's funny, they uh, brought a f some people out to film the dropping of this tree. Yeah. So I came out with my chainsaw. I was the one who got to cut it. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I make the cut like you're supposed to, got it falling this way. It started to fall and 
<laughs> you had a little branch up there. It got caught on that, oh, and it no. wouldn't fall. <laughs> and they had, they had to film and camera and everything. The tree went like that far and stopped. <laughs> We're like, what are we going to do? Uh, fortunately, like that weekend, there was a big windstorm yeah. and it knocked it down. Oh, my God. But here's something really interesting. It made you look bad, though. <laughs> it did. It did. Right. So this is interesting here. If you look at the rings yeah. in the tree, you can see that oh, when the tree tiny. was young, yeah. yeah, look how tiny it is. Yeah. And then somewhere in here, it got up enough to get its light, yeah. and it started to grow faster. And it grew really fast until it started to get older. And something must have happened to it because it died, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it just died. So the rings started getting closer. So yeah, you can look back a little bit in time. And how old did you I count, estimate this? It was, uh, it was pushing 200. Okay. Yeah, hundred. Can't remember. One hundred seventy, maybe I, rings I counted wow. in this tree. Insane. Yeah. And then, do you ever go back? You know, with your uh, what, where you're measuring the circumference and the species of tree, and say, "Oh yeah, we're really close to that." Oh, age. so there's a Tompkins County Community College has yeah. a, a professor who brings students out on a regular basis, and they're starting to measure the trees and record your growth. Yeah. So we'll have that data eventually. Oh, I'm not good. doing it, but yeah. uh, his class is doing yeah, that. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. It's a, I think we benefit so much in this area with Cornell and it's, all the other universities that are doing studies and we yeah. really gain insight from that. Yep. This is, you know, there'll be several studies as we walk through here, we'll see. There, there's a Penn State group collecting leaf litter in the fall. There's like mentioned a group measuring this tree circumferences yeah. and, uh, classes come out here well we could really learn from it and i think that having something like this like the, it, it's it seems really aspirational for us you know with our young woods here's mm -hmm. some of your trout lilies yep yep i saw those pop up I this don't know if we'll see any flower because it's a little bit past a little past yeah oh and then this is a uh, is this gallium or yeah it's a gallium yeah. I, i'm not sure what specific species it is maybe like odorata or something this is also one of our native species. I'd like to see that come back. Oh, here's a, a really good example of the, the beech bark problem. So it's a scale insect, yeah. and the scale insect burrows in. And this is the, the white is a, on top of the scale, oh, the little wax they exudate. And then it makes the holes, and then the nectary of fungus comes in those holes and then starts to girdle the tree. And was this um, always here? Or no, was the fungus was always here, but it never got into the tree because it had bark. Yeah. When this, um, this scale insect was introduced, I want to say like maybe in the 1930s, you know, just again, another invasive species yeah. is taking down the natives. And it's really hard for resistance to develop in this. If it was a disease, maybe, but when it's an insect drilling a hole. Yeah. And then uh, I guess like with the the scale insect, you know, I get the sense that, you know, there's some trees as they mature, they get this really craggy, thick bark. Right. And then I look at beech beech yeah. trees and it's this very thin right. bark. And I'd see that yes. it's probably more susceptible. Exactly, exactly. So you won't see this happening to, you know, maybe even a sugar maple yeah. or a shag bark hickory or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Because it's shaggy bark. Yeah. So it's not. It's not like it's not like the elder ash borer where that is spe specific to ash. This could potentially affect. I'm or is not. It's, that's a really good question. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure whether yeah. this scale insect will affect other trees, trees that this, have smooth bark. Like right. in theory, it might like the striped maple. The striped maple. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. But I've not yeah. seen it on yeah. the striped maple. Yeah. It is, it's nicely, highly walkable here. <laughs> yeah, that, so we have a Mother's Day hike yeah. every year because it's nice and flat and uh, it's the and right then, time of the year to see the wildflowers. And then here's your May apples. Yeah. With some wet areas and we find them all strewn throughout. Yeah, and then the impatience are coming yes. up. Right here. Uh, okay. <laughs> I just like knocked it I over. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, As long as I, as long as I did not, I, as long as I didn't I'm step on it. <laughs> oh, and black birch. There's more. Black birch. Yeah. And so, if you look at that black birch, not this one, but the next one over. Yeah. That, you see all its roots are growing out of the ground. Oh yeah. And so I always ask people, 
why are the roots out of the ground? Of course, everybody says, well, cause the soil eroded away from the roots yeah. on the hillside. I said, no. Black birch love to germinate on old logs or mounds. Ah. So they get their roots established. Then the tree rots away. And, and the roots it gets exposed. are right. Yeah. It's very common for black birch to do that. Wow. So a lot of them have these exposed roots. Has any of these trees been tapped for like birch? We, or we've not people? allowed people to okay. tap trees in here. We've yeah. been asked, but we just feel like it's a little bit too in, intrusive. Yeah. Just allow the trees to do the thing. So here's a, a beech tree that succumbed to the beech bark disease, unfortunately. And then is there any like need off. to clear it out or no, I guess not because it's, the fungus has always been here. It's more about the scale. That's right. So the fungus has always been here. It'll, it's a wood rotting fungus. It can do its thing, Yeah. but it's the scale we want to get. We would like to be able to get rid of somehow. And I don't know how you, how we do that. So these beach that are coming up here would probably never get big. No, like, an like that here, one there looks one. like it's already on its way out. Yeah, and then this one pops up. And this yeah. one already has a little bit of scale on it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah like this one. <laughs> this is actually, isn't this when it starts to fruit when it gets too? Yeah, deep? you can see right there's a little so bud. There's a little mm -hmm. flower right here. So typically when it just has one, it doesn't get the flower. Crap. And then when you have two of these, It'll right. start to get the flower, and then that's when you could fruit. And then that's when you're, you're able to, to collect it. Mm -hmm. And that takes many years yeah. also for it to get that large. There's the yellow poplar. I've never yeah. seen yellow poplar with mature bark like that. It's so cool. Because <laughs> it, when it's young, it's smooth bark. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then, when I was first like learning my trees, too, I was really confused by that. Because I, I grew up. I guess it was secondary forest, and yeah. you know, the tree forest may have been 40 years old, and the trees are still pretty smooth on the yellow poplar. And then I come here, and it's like, whoa! And you have <laughs> to really because rough. like you can't see the buds; they're all the they're way, way up, up there. Top. Yeah. Yes, exactly. You can see um, every once in a while some will fall off on the ground. Yeah, you can see them that way. Yeah, I always try to identify the trees where I'm looking at the leaves on the ground, on the ground. and I'm like, <laughs> I think it came from you. Yeah. <laughs> And then you got some grape vines over here. Mm -hmm. You haven't had any of um, like invasive, like oriental bittersweet or anything like that, no. right? No. Okay. No. I see it through Pennsylvania, but oh, foam flower. Is this yes. foam flower? Yes. Oh, cool. This I noticed was blooming in, in the city, in New York City, but it looks like it's hasn't bloomed yet or did No, you it has yet? not bloomed yet. Okay. Yep. Yep. Oh, here's the oh, flowering, yeah, that's, flowering the yes. one that gets the. the the doll eyes and flower before it'll get its berries. Does it have a scent? I haven't noticed the scent. It's very faint, but I can't even place what that smells like. I have no words for it. <laughs> <laughs> it smells like its own thing. Here you have some Christmas fern. Right, so this stays evergreen mm -hmm. pretty much all year, right? Yes, so that's, I guess, how it got its name, Christmas fern. Yeah. And how many acres is this? Did you this say? is 32. Okay, but you said at one point it was six, like was it 600? Yeah. yeah, it was. Uh, so from that corner, like down this way, yeah, down that way. Okay. And then, uh, I'm gonna stay in the front of here because I'm gonna ask you a question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this tree here, yeah, it's uh, pretty. There aren't very many trees this size, uh -huh. and you can see from the bark, it's not like a common tree that you'll see. So no. it's a little bit on the rare side, particularly this far north, it's normally found much further south. And we're not really, and there's some here, yeah. but it's, we're kind of at the northern end of its range. We're at and the northern end of its range? Northern end of its range. And um, it's related to tulip poplar. Magnolia? It's, family. it's a magnolia. Yeah, it's a cucumber magnolia. And does it does it get really beautiful flowers and everything? Way up high. Yeah. But again, it's really hard because it's such a big tree. Right. It's hard to see. And then it, it produces has it these. Has flowered? Because I feel like all the magnolia has flowered, the smaller ones, but. These are going to flower now. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they produce those little cucumbery like seed yeah. pods. And, uh, yeah, very good. Yeah. 
Well, you you said it's related to the tulip poplar. Yeah, I gave it, yeah. <laughs> so you gave me that. It's kind of like it's. It what rhymes, else would it be? It right? rhymes with lignolia. <laughs> like I'm like, okay, let me let me get it down. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> uh, uh, Peter Marks is a plant ecologist. He was at Cornell for years and years and years, and he was a co-author in a book I gave you. Yeah. But anyway, we came out here with him, and we were walking through here for like the first time, and he saw a tree. He just. He just <laughs> Oh, it's a cucumber magnolia. Yeah. It was like so had that image in my head. He was I, so blown away. I think it's so cool because like sometimes when I come out to the woods, you know, and I have I've been so, you know, stuck in the city for so long, right? And then you come out into the woods and you feel like you're have literally having a religious experience yes. because you're just like, oh, yeah. oh yeah, I, I've been so far away from you for so long, and then you see something that is almost pedestrian, you know, it should be, you know, common, and it becomes so. Um, astronomically like touching to you because you see it for the first time or yeah. see it in a long time. Mm -hmm. That's probably how we felt about the magnolia. Yeah. But yeah. I think they're beautiful in the landscape, but to see one this large, it's, it's insane. pretty incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And it has its silvery, this kind of silvery, papery bark. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. It's really unique bark. Yeah. yeah. And is it one of a kind here? There are I found a few smaller ones okay. down in the lower but they're maybe yeah. that big. Yeah. But nothing, I, I'm not seeing one this big. Do you think it was, um, their seedlings were munched on by deer? Are they tasty to deer, you think, or no? I don't know. Because maybe that's why you I, haven't seen so many. Maybe that's why so many. It could be. Yeah. Because we found that that's true for like our oak. None of our oak has regenerated because it just, it's like the deer, deer food. Yeah. 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 What's, that's, what's this actually? I, well, I this is um, Mayflower, Myriophyllum. Oh, okay. It produces little tiny, little tiny white yeah. flowers and a little stalk. Here's a red maple, and the bark's a little bit different than a sugar maple. It's hard to describe yeah. in words, but it's uh Whoa, look shaggier. at that beautiful beach back there. Yeah, it's like Yeah, that was listening. not affected yet. Wow, yeah. that is yeah. just so, it's like a baby skin. <laughs> it feels like, you know what I mean? It's yeah, like, like so baby's perfect. bottom there, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's beautiful. And then another tree. You don't see them uh, like that anymore. We haven't seen is the basswood. Oh yes, the tilia. Yep. This is um, Sonder. This is the one that you love the smell of the flowers of. That has the heart-shaped flower or the heart-shaped leaves, and then looks like a sap sucker or something got into it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Some kind of woodpecker. And they're pretty uh, distinctive. They have these side shoots come up from the trunk. Yeah. It's one of the ways you can tell it easily. And you don't have to cut these back or anything like that. Right? Again, we're leaving it yeah, in its natural as state because that's how it grows. And then we see, yeah, bloodroot. It's kind of like, is there any more of this? Uh, I saw, where did I, where you, I saw a little one here. We'll see more of it as we okay. walk around. Yeah. Uh, but there's this little patch right here where the yeah. trail came through. This looks like it could be someone's this home. Is, yeah, so most people think that trees are solid, although yeah. the older trees mostly aren't. Really? The only It's only the outer part of the tree that's alive. Yeah. And so that you can reach all the way through. Yeah, it's that's completely cool. Hollow. Better get your foot, hand like Just, <laughs> bit off in there. Yeah. Oh, it's nice and cold in there. Yeah. Yeah, you can put like your, <laughs> you know, your, your cold one in there. <laughs> like a little. Store some drinks. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> A lot more grapevines over here. Yes, a little bit of light, a mm -hmm. little bit more water as we get a little wet because vines need lots of water to support themselves. Mm -hmm. They don't have uh, they don't have good structure at all, but they live by transporting water really quickly so they can grow quickly. Yeah. So they need light and water. When you have light and water, the vines really grow, like in the tropics. Yeah. Where you have that combination. Oh, here. So like here's you're yeah. Oh. So here's a black birch. Yeah. Black birch, they're going to grow, and that soil is eventually going to erode away. Right. And then. But this looks like it got its roots like cut off on cut that off one and it's at least. Off, but, yeah. but yeah, this is this is such a great example of what it looks like, and also what the bark starts to look like before it becomes the incredible Hulk and it like breaks out of its bark and yeah. turns all craggy. Right. So, do, so what do, exactly do, happened here? This is an old tree. So this is so a tree fell over, and it tipped up some soil. And then the black birch started growing on top of that soil mound. 
and then that soil erodes away and leaves the black birch with its roots exposed. Well, when I think of birch, I think of like the kind of first movers in the landscape or on the interstitial. They don't last like a tremendous amount of time. They're not old growth, old growth. you know, or like the dominant yeah. climax forest species. Yeah. yeah, so I always think of them as like, they probably need some kind of disturbance or something. Yeah. And yeah. Does somebody have a key or a knife or something? I want to I have something. a... A key? I forgot. Yeah, a key work. I yeah. just, yeah, I just want to, this is my, sure we get back I'll that. give it right back to you. Does anybody have like a hundred dollar bill? You know, just, uh, yeah. <laughs> run away. <laughs> so, let's see if I can scrape this off here. Run, unlock the key. Yeah. <laughs> Does it smell nice? Yeah, it smells yeah. really nice. It's like sorry. <laughs> is that right? Oh my God. That Strength. smells like root beer or birch beer. Smell that. Gotta hit that up. <laughs> Wintergreen. <laughs> Some of the uh, native peoples would chew the sticks. I when I was a kid, yeah. I chewed the sticks. Yeah. That's why I chew the sticks all the time. <laughs> really good. Yeah, it's yeah. so good. It's like candy. You almost like want to lick it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so so years from now, people are going to come along yeah. and they're going to say, "Oh, the, how come the roots are out of the ground, and how come this tree has all these marks on it?" Yeah, exactly. Somebody's <laughs> been scratching and right, sniffing. That's my that's my scratch and sniff tree. <laughs> I bring tours He's here. Like the so, buck. You, so you can tell how many tours I've had yeah. by how many <laughs> scratches around the tree. Oh my God. Uh, another black birds in a mound? Yeah. And then down here is a really good example. When you start to reveal this, you know, to us, it's like <laughs> speaking a different language. It's so it's so illuminating. This is a the best example that I've, I think we'll see of a black birch growing on top of a tip-up mound. So this hemlock tree fell, yeah. right? Tipped up the soil, and look what's growing on it. OMG. OMG. That's crazy. Yeah, because, and you can tell it's, because otherwise if it was growing, if it was growing prior to, it would have been growing horizontally, which wouldn't have oh, right. sense. Oh, right, exactly, yeah. exactly, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Yep. That's crazy. Yeah. Unbelievable. Well, they're opportunists, let me tell you. Yep. And then I see you could probably have some vernal pools in here. Oh, this, the... through this area is pretty wet. Yeah. So if you notice, we've come down now yeah. from the top to the lower. The soil type changes, it's a little bit less well-drained. Uh -huh. And so up here, well-drained, this would be really good agricultural soil. It's like Niagara, it's a good agricultural soil down here. It's not so much. And a lot of people think, oh, because it's wetter, the trees will grow bigger, but actually it's smaller because there's less oxygen in the soil. Yeah. But the species change. So if, once we start walking through here, we'll see species we haven't seen before. Like, for example, a yellow birch. Oh, yeah. The paper yellow bark. Yep. And then I see some purple, pinkish flowers down here that I hadn't seen before. I don't know what they are on the right. Do you see it? Oh, those are geraniums? Oh, those are the geraniums. Yeah, okay. Well, I did see the geraniums. Yeah, up we there, saw them, but they were, not they flower. weren't flowering. Right. Yeah, so a lot of people think, you know, the geraniums are what they plant in their flower boxes, but those are pelargonium. Yeah. Right? Okay, now I see an, is that an ash tree? Or no? Or no? The one with the bark that's missing? It is an ash tree, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll start to see white ash yeah. through here. Yeah. There's something, I don't think it's uh, emerald ash borer, but there's something chewing on the bark. Yeah. But a lot of times, um, you know, porcupines will scrape on the bark and chew on the bark looking for insects. Porcupines, that's something we haven't seen yet. That'll be fun to see. Uh, oh, I can show you a porcupine damaged tree back at the beginning. Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe but not a little real afterwards. live porcupine. I've yeah. <laughs> not seen any in here. But we have evidence that they're here. So, but this looks like emerald ash borer. That looks like boreholes, no? It, they have more of a C shape oh, okay. hole. So I don't think, it's, here they're scraping off the outside. So I'd say this yeah. is more maybe a bird or something. Okay. Oh, okay, so there. that's good to know. So even if you see this damage, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the boar. Correct. Getting in there. So how would you recognize the boar? So from what I understand, since they aren't here, they're more of a C-shaped entrance hole. Okay. C-shaped. And then this is horn, is this a horn It's one of the hornbeams. Yeah. yeah, Australia. Yep. Flaky bark. You'll see your hickory down here then too somewhere? Yeah, we'll, we'll come up with a lot of, there's hickory right here. Oh yeah, bitter knot. Bitter okay. knot. It looks like it's eating its- uh... I know, I gotta get that sign out of there. I can't, <laughs> won't come out now, cause it's- <laughs> <laughs> This is consuming. Yeah. 
And then witch hazel. Oh, nice hamamelis. Yeah. This gets uh, yellow flowers during the winter time. It's a really nice understory, it's like kind of sub shrubby tree. Yeah, so yeah, flowers like late in the fall and during the winter. Yeah. And for a long time, people weren't sure why it flowered then because there's no pollinators out then. But there actually there is, there's a moth huh. that pollinates it. A moth. That's amazing. Yeah. This is one Flutters of the, around the cold. ones I'd like to reestablish as well. I love the smell of it. And what else are you going to get flowering at that time? I too? know. Yeah? Nothing. So. Nothing. I hear a woodpecker in there somewhere. <laughs> a dead tree. Yeah. I don't know if you're noticing this, uh, Sonder, but we're starting to get more into kind of like a, a more of a forest that we have. So we, you're seeing more hickory, seeing some uh, white pine, the hornbeam, the hemlock. Ah, uh, there it is. Yeah. The woolly adelgid. So this was an introduced insect as well. It's kind of like a little mealy buggy kind of thing. And this was affecting our hemlocks. A lot of our hemlocks have pulled through it though, haven't they? So my understanding is that in the, we're right in the margin of this. So like yeah. in a really cold winter, it'll kind of go away from here, okay. but it'll stay along the lake. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a mild winter. So I think that's why we're seeing it here because last year it wasn't. Yeah. So we're just on that edge. Okay, we so, had a mild winter yeah, this year? Yeah, it was long, but it, it was wasn't long. really super cold. <laughs> okay. So temperature wise, there weren't really like, it wasn't 20 below, right, like sometimes right, guess. I right. mean, it barely got down to zero. Long. It was very long. It was pretty it was, cold. It was, it was great for cross-country skiing. It was like the best winter we've had ever, which is nice because there was a pandemic and you couldn't do anything, but yeah. you could cross-country ski almost every day. White oak. This is, our, oak. this is like our big white oak, Like, but ours is, you have to fit three people okay. around it to go around it. There's a white oak right here too. So I guess right we could we could really estimate our white oak by using some of the um, information, right? Like from the, actually physically measuring our circumference? Well, you might be able to, if it's, a, I mean, the, the problem is, you know, your soil type and moisture conditions are probably different. Different, so it's okay. gonna affect the growth rate. Right. Maybe differently. This is, I off, when I bring my students here, uh, it's a good place to compare a red oak uh -huh. to a white oak, because you can see the differences the in the bark. Yeah. And also, White oaks tend to be a lot more erect uh -huh. in terms of their growth habit, and red oaks are a little flatter. Uh-huh. More decumbent. Like, how would you really be able to identify one over the other? Well, the bark is... The, see that? The bark in a tree is different. This is a little more riveted, more fissured, and darker. And then this is, like, silvery gray and, like, flaky, yeah. you know. And but then, look, if you look up right here, you can see the branching pattern on a white oak, it's a lot more upright, like their branches are reaching up. Whereas in a red oak, red oak they're like more this. like that. And of course you have the leaves too. Yeah. The fall. And then the red oak but, has these like, uh, yeah. you know, kind of toothed edges. And then the white oak are more like round yeah. lobed. So here's a red oak leaf with the sharp teeth and white oak are a lot more smooth. Hmm. And then you're seeing all this uh, trout lilies. I've yes. never seen so many trout lilies before in my life. <laughs> and we can see the little seed pod. Yeah, the seed pod's coming it's up. Warmed. Oh my goodness, look at this. So these have already flowered and that's what's left. Yeah. So different. So here's a younger oh, cucumber magnolia. Oh, there you go, yeah. But not the big one. So this, that could be mama up there. Yeah. And then what's that one right there? Is that another oak? Yeah. Okay. See, when I look at these two, I'm like, oh, then the bark starts to look very similar to me all of a sudden. And I think there's, right here's a nice shag bark hickory. Tulip poplar. So our, our woods really dominate with uh, shag bark and oak. He's eating it too. All the hickories yeah, are eating there. I gotta there. get those signs off. <laughs> <laughs> So funny, they look like little beaver teeth. <laughs> oh, the muscle wood. Muscle wood, iron wood. 
Look at this. And they have little lichen. Is this like a fungus? Little lichens. A little yeah. lichen starting uh -huh. on it? Yeah, what are those spots? Yep. It's a combination of algae and fungus that uh, coexist, co-evolve together. And off this, of trees. this is a really cool tree. Because these could be pretty old, but they're, they could Still be small. tiny. Yeah. yeah. They, the rings are really close together. Yeah. And they use this wood for uh, like axe handles and hammers and things like that. Yeah. So it's like really strong. Yeah. Ironwood, muscle wood. But, but it also looks like muscles, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But the other thing, problem with common names is that this is also called ironwood. Ironwood, yeah. This is the uh, eastern hornbeam. Yeah. So Hot the, hornbeam. But it, all, same thing, it has very hard wood. Yeah. And uh, can be used for those tools. I haven't seen this really large though either. Um, yeah, they don't get massive. Yeah. I've seen them maybe like this big around. Yeah. Do you oh, want yeah, to say about sedges? Hey, do you have any of that kind of um, Japanese grass that has come through here or no? You don't have I don't that see, problem. We haven't seen that yet. Okay. So let me talk about these sedges for a second. Yeah. So a lot of people think these are grasses, but they're not. They're sedges. They have uh, edges. They sedges have edges. Yeah. Whereas grasses don't. Yeah. And the really cool thing about a sedge, at least so I think it's cool, is that when the seeds are formed, they have a little uh, bag of oil attached to the seed. Hmm. The seed falls to the ground. With this little bag of oil attached. And then along comes an ant, picks up the seed with the oil, takes it back to its nest, eats the oil, and leaves the seed in a site that's been cultivated. Yeah. It's dry. Yeah. And all the little dead ant parts and all are fertilizer. Right. So it's figured out a way to get itself to a garden. That's so in the cool. forest. And sedges do this, and they also found trillium, and a lot of these spring ephemerals do it. It's wow. a way of getting them to a good site for germination. That's insane. So it has like this, uh, what is it called, Mir Mir like Miramectica or Miramicodia or whatever, yeah, yeah. yeah, where they have that that combination where they partner with ants yes. somehow. Yep. Yeah, this is uh, called an Eliasome is a scientific name uh -huh. for that. And then we also, right here, right there by your foot is a sensitive fern. These are quite common, yep. you see them on trail heads and everything. Mm -hmm. And this is another Lero dendron? Yeah, wow. isn't that amazing? Wow, it's so, <laughs> so crazy. It's unbelievable how large they are and how straight, you straight. know, mm -hmm. straight as an arrow. Right. Wow. And so you have a little walking through the woods and I heard voices and people talking and laughing. So it's all oh, come over. And I was walking this way anyway, say hi. I got over here and I could hear the voices, but I didn't see anybody. And I looked up and they were way up on the top of the tree. They crawled up the, the tree? Cornell has a tree climbing club. Oh my God. Yeah. And I said, how did you, how did you get up there? Because I knew they couldn't like wrap something around yeah. the tree and climb. So they, they take a rope, a little thin rope uh -huh. on like a, a, a slingshot or a bow and they shoot it. It goes up and they hope it catches a branch and comes down. Then they tie a bigger rope to that and pull it up over. Oh my and God. And then they repel up the rope, up into the high trees. And they were out here, you know, doing that, practicing. So I said, you know, how, how high up are you? And they said, we're between 140 and 150 feet. Oh my God, I would shit my pants. So. <laughs> I would totally the, shit my pants. To have trees that tall <laughs> yeah. is really pretty impressive. Oh my God. How do they do it in, with the honey hunters, Joey, that you filmed that go up into the trees? How do they climb up, with ladders? Have, um, they have this thing. Oh, so they I wrap like it the, around the tree and then yeah. with their feet they go up. Yeah. Okay. But man, this is 150 <laughs> feet tall. Maybe? Yep, that's what they said. The, the rope is 150 feet near at the end of the rope. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a really good place to see some of these turnip mounds. Yeah. They just they are all over the place. So between these and the fact there's no branches down low. Yeah. And these trees are so straight. So then like that's when a tree falls over and the root is like kind of vertical. Right. Uh, perpendicular to the, the ground and then they just kind of it die back. Rots away. Yeah. Yep. And then it forms these like when the, it's wet, you can have uh -huh. these little vernal pools and exactly. that's great for the amphibians. Right. Oh here's some blood root. Nice little clump. Oh there you go. Yeah. Another one of our natives. It's bloodroot, and it's called uh, bloodroot because when you dig it up this yeah. Yeah, and break the root, it's just red. It just looks like blood. And it has a and, nice white, white flower mm -hmm. on it. Yeah, it hasn't quite flowered yet. The yeah. flower buds should be, yeah, here's a flower bud right here. It's coming oh, here. up. 
It hasn't flowered yet. Yeah. And the cool thing about this name of this plant, the scientific name of the genus is Sanguinaria. Yeah. It comes from blood. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen the hepatica yet, though. I know, I was just, I, this is what I was thinking. Yeah. I saw one in here. When I was here on Sunday, I was giving a tour and I saw it. My brain is like foggy because I've been out of the habitat for so long. And it's so funny how like all of a sudden some names will come back to me and others are like, <laughs> uh, you know, way back there with the cobwebs on. Well, thank you, Marvin. This is a pleasure because it really shows us what our forest can become if you just leave it. And interestingly enough, back in the turn of the century, 10% of our New York was forested because all the rest of the forests were cut down. Oh. And now it's up to almost 60%. So we're making progress. Making progress. And, and hopefully now people have a, a better view of what their forest can become. Could look like, exactly. Because we didn't pay attention back in the day, I guess. Yeah. Thank you so much, Marvin. You're this quite really, welcome. This it's really, really enjoyable. Yeah. If you haven't heard yet, we'll be donating and investing 10% of our YouTube AdSense revenue from this channel back into the Finger Lakes community. We're so thankful that Espoma, our partners across both Plant One On Me and Flock Finger Lakes channels will be matching those funds this year, as well as through a combination of monies and or products, depending on the project. So just know that by watching these videos, you're helping the community here.